Jeff Gerwich here from Modern Tactical Shooting. Now this video is all about how to rig up your plate carrier for full blown combat or war. Specifically how I wore this ATS plate carrier for two tours in Afghanistan. It's a lot different than say if I was gonna wear a plate carrier for say PST type bodyguard operations or just you know range training out on the range. Uh, Full-blown combat has to do with movement to contacts, multiple day operations, and working with a team. So you got to carry a lot more gear than, say, if you were just, you know, thinking of self-protection. Now, the point of this video is not to go over, you know, a you know full-blown concept of all the different pouches I wore. It's really to cover how my mindset is when talking about rigging up a plate carrier for combat. There's a few guidelines I follow. Now, full disclosure here. Uh, I am an ATS brand ambassador. 90% of the pouches and this plate carrier is ATS tactical brand. Uh, I do some of their social media and I get some of their gear, but mainly I get it to prototype. I actually, you know, went through the Special Forces Q course with the owner of ATS Tactical Gear, Mike Lose. He's a former 10th Special Forces Group guy. So my relationship with ATS has actually been, you know, personal first before Mike started ATS. And then, of course, later on, again, I do some of their social media and I get obviously free gear, but mainly I get it to prototype. For instance, this horizontal, you know, fast magazine pouch, which I've talked a lot about or demonstrated in a lot of other videos. I actually prototyped this horizontal fast mag, this very one in Afghanistan because I wanted a super fast reload for a plate carrier. I got with Mike. We designed this up and I, you know, prototyped it in Afghanistan. So I do have a relationship with ATS and it just worked out, you know, I get most of my gear from them. But let's continue. Now talking about principles of rigging up a plate carrier, and this is something I've always followed even uh, through all my tours of combat. I did three in Iraq and three in Afghanistan with special forces. And the main principle or guideline I follow is fighting stuff up front and support items in the back. And what do I mean by that? Anything I can use to kill the enemy with, I wear on the front. Everything else is mission supporting to include uh, IFAC and how I wear my radio, which is counter to how a lot of SF soldiers wear their radios. You'll see 99% of them wear them in the front. I wore mine in the back and I'll go over how and why I was able to do this. Also, when I get to the IFAC, I don't wear it on the front. I wore my IFAC on the back and that has to do with a team SOP. It's actually countered how the army Thinks of IFACs, they think you should wear it to you know aid yourself once you get blasted. We had a different SOP, which I think is better, but I'll get into that in a little bit. So let me start at the front of the plate carrier and I'll work around. Now to kick it off a basic load, I've always carried six magazines in my plate carrier, one in my belt and one in my gun for a total of eight magazines. Now I have uh, three set up here on the front with the bungees. I've always used retainers, except for what we call sometimes the special forces, we call it the happy mag, which is one magazine that doesn't have any sort of retention device. And this is for your super fast emergency or speed reload. I started out with this fast mag. I've been using fast mags forever. They're great pouches. But halfway through my third tour, I wanted one more fast magazine pouch for a super fast blazing reload. And that's when I got with ATS Tactical Gear and we came up with this horizontal fast mag. I, you know, prototyped it in Afghanistan on that tour and, you know, it worked out great. Retains the magazine, super positive. Uh, and, you know, doesn't get damaged if you're going into the prone. Now this plate carrier itself, before I get into everything else, this is an ATS Aegis plate carrier. I actually got this in my second, halfway through my second tour in Afghanistan. At the time I was actually wearing a Blackhawk Rhodesian chest rig with a back plate carrier. It's actually a miserable design because that front plate is only held in place by elastic retention band. So the hard plate is sitting against your chest. And after, you know, eight to 12 hours of it rubbing against you raw, it's not the best feeling in the world. Uh, Mike came out with this plate carrier in 2014. He sent me the first prototype, which is this Aegis carrier right here. Uh, and it has padding on the inside for that plate. And, uh, you know, I've worn it ever since. I think it's a great plate carrier. So again, this is 90% ATS brand type stuff just because of my relationship and it's good quality gear made in the US. But back to the full basic load. So six on my plate carrier. Uh, I've always, you know, worn those six mags. You know, the army came up with seven magazines as a good base load. Whoever thought of that is pretty good because that's a pretty good balance between, you know, weight and ammunition capacity. 
and weight and balancing, you know, weight, maneuverability, and armor, that's a constant struggle with setting up plate carriers anyways. You talk to any army dude, it doesn't have to even be special forces. Probably every tour, they're re-rigging their kit to find that perfect balance between weight, mobility, protection, and, you know, how much stuff you can carry. And, uh, you know, with everything rigged up here, which I'll get into, this tipped over just 30 pounds, fully loaded, by the time I got done rigging it up. And again, I'd wear this for one to three days at a time, depending on the duration of the mission. But back to the magazines. So I've had five in the front, and then on my support side, uh, on the cummerbund, I've always worn an extra one or two. If you noticed on my cummerbund here, there's a gap. I am a lefty with my rifle righty pistol, so I always left the right side of my plate carrier on the cummerbund clear so I can reach my pistol. Lastly, on my support hand side, one grenade pouch. I carried one grenade, sometimes two. I found out the hard way when you need one grenade, there's a good chance you need half a dozen. That's why you should always be fighting with teammates. I actually had a teammate with more Afghan experience than me. And the time when I did throw a grenade in combat, we needed more. He literally had half a dozen grenades on him and we put them to good use. So that completes my you know, fighting, killing loadout, at least one grenade, sometimes two. On the other side of my cummerbund, opposite side of my pistol, again, I'm a righty with a pistol. I carried a Gerber auto opening knife on the left hand side of my body. And the reason for this is I'm not a big knife fighter. I'm not going to face off with somebody with my knife and go at it West Side Story, sty West Side Story style. The whole reason for carrying a knife is utility. But if I do get tackled, because of my training, we have a thing called SOCP, Special Operations Combatives Program. It's a lot of grappling and fighting in kit. If you get tackled, we're trained to protect the pistol in the holster with your firing hand. So basically you can have one hand out of the fight, making sure you don't fall victim to a gun grab that leaves one hand to do the fighting. That's why you should carry your knife opposite side of your pistol so you can hopefully get to it and use that knife to make space just so you can clear your pistol and finish the fight that way. We don't train to do arm bars and choke outs. We do some of that, but the whole point is to fight to your pistol and finish the grappling fight with lead. I can always tell a novice guy who hasn't had a lot of combatives training because he tends to wear their knife on the same side of their pistol. Kind of like you've seen those old Vietnam photos of guys wearing a pistol and a knife right behind it. That's kind of silly because your firing hand is going to be taking out, you know, protecting against gun grab. So knife always opposite or center line of your body so you can get to it with your opposite hand. Also, on the speaking of the cummerbund, I always kept my chest seals uh, on the left and right sides of the cummerbund. I had some in my IFAC, of course, but because the cummerbund lays flat, it's a perfect you know, pocket for chest seals. Also, always carried a surefire backup hand light in one of my uh, cummerbund side panels here. If you notice on the front of the carrier, I have actually a tourniquet kind of in the center and one off to the side. Of course, you always got to have a tourniquet that you can reach with either hand in case you get wounded. I always carried another tourniquet. That way, if I came upon a wounded te teammate, I could use that tourniquet and save the one for myself. So I always wore two tourniquets. Uh, extra pistol mag pouch on towards the front. I've always carried at least three extra pistol mags, usually two on my belt and one on the carrier. So I have a total of four mags on me with that one in the gun. So between the mags, grenade, pistol, uh, pistol mags, the knife, that covers the stuff, my fighting loadout. Now, speaking of magazines, my last tour, I was a team sergeant. That was my position or duty on the team. And my role is a manager, meaning once we get in a firefight, I help direct bodies into the fight, make sure we have enough assets in place, meaning, you know, partner forces and the guys have the bodies they need to do to win the gunfight, you know, run the support by fire. If there's any casualties, my job is to take them out of the fight so the medics can concentrate on the casualties. I can worry about evacing them and the guys that are in the fight can stay in the firefight and focus on that. So I'm more of a manager and a support role during most of the engagements. You know, that's what a team sergeant ought to be doing, managing the fight so the guys can actually concentrate on doing the fighting itself and knowing they have the right personnel and assets in place. The most mags I ever shot in a firefight during my last tour in Afghanistan, I went through four mags. So for me in my support role, 
Uh, that was quite a bit. That was half the basic load I had carrying me. That was a pretty thick day. I know a lot of SF guys who don't carry as much mags uh, as a full basic load. I think that's a mistake. You need to have at least that 210 rounds on you and not rely on, say, taking mags from your Afghan partner forces. I know some guys used to do that. Uh, I'm going to have, I'm never going to run out of ammo in a firefight. So I always had the eight on me. And then in my day pack, I always had at least an extra three mags. I like to carry 300 rounds of 5.56 on me, you know, going into these missions. Now, getting back to the radio, I wore a KDU right here in this small pouch. This is actually an ATS KDU pouch. A KDU was a little remote. This folds down so I could have access to it. It's a little remote that actually controlled the 152 military radio, which I had at the time, that allowed me to wear my radio on the back out of the way and not off center on the left and right like you see most military guys do. Uh, you have to be able to have access to the controls on your radio to change frequencies and channels and things like that. So having the remote allowed me to wear it on the back of my plate carrier. I had this custom Kydex pouch made for a 152, had it made downrange in Afghanistan by a buddy of mine. If I did not have that KDU remote here in the front, I would have worn my radio, you know, just off to the left and right, like you see most guys wear. You gotta have it, uh, access to the radio again but the KDU allowed me to run in the back and I don't think uh, it's even made anymore. The Army's moved on from the 152 radio. They're using something else now. I don't know if they have remotes, but this was a money maker for me because again, it allowed me to follow my principle of fighting stuff on the front and support stuff on the back. Finishing up the back of the carrier, I have a hydration bladder holder. Of course, this is ATS brand. Now, wearing water on carriers has fallen out of favor with a lot of SF guys due to the cramped confines of the vehicles we used in Afghanistan. Personally, I think that's a mistake. You should always have water on your carrier. This is a little one-quart holder with a one-quart source bladder. I think it's foolhardy to rely on, you know, having the chance to grab some water bottles and throw them in your pockets whenever you leave a vehicle. Because again, a 15 minute exploration to go check something out could turn into a two or three hour long gunfight. I always want to have water on me. That's just me. Something I'm never going to go without on my carrier is hydration. Speaking of hydration, back in 2014, my second tour in Afghanistan, a fellow SF guy turned me on to this one little super handy product. It is made by Source and it is their UTA adapter. I kept it in my GP pouch. Uh, this little adapter here actually hooks to uh, the front you know, mouthpiece on your Source. This actually just unclips and you can plug your UTA right into it. And this allows you to take a water bottle, squeeze it and refill your bladder on the go. So instead of having your buddy, you know, say, hey, fill, fill, you know, pour some bottles of water into my bladder and refill me or having to take off your carrier to refill the bladder, you, you know, clip this bad boy on, hook it to a water bottle and you can instantly top off your reservoir. So I think for $14, I think is what I paid for this. This is probably one of the best pieces of kit that I own. Super cool little device. This is a source UTA. It only works with source bladders, but that's all I run anyways. Let me clip this bad boy back on here. Now, speaking of the GP pouch, a word on my strong side or my you know, rifle grip side. Again, because I'm a right, righty with the pistol, lefty with the rifle, you know, I kept my right hand clear to get to my pistol. So my GP pouch I wore on my left side of the plate carrier. And mainly this is for map markers, casualty feeder cards, my UTA. I kept a compass in here. Helmet light. Now, contrary to action movies and video games, Usually only one person wears a strobing light on their helmet per element. If everybody's strobing, you're going to white out all the sensors on the aircraft that are following you. It's too much. Normally the JTAC, he'd be strobing. Or if we broke into separate elements, you know, if we had two or three moving elements, one guy per element would be strobing. So this spent 90% of the time in my GP pouch not on my helmet strobing away, because again, you don't want to white out the aircraft. One strobe is enough if you're in one element. Also, it's not on here, but you need to have your night vision goggles with you at all times. I wasn't a big fan of wearing on top of my helmet, you know, all day long because they get heavy. I don't have a pouch here on my plate carrier for nods, but on my belt, I had a dedicated nods pouch. 
So day or night, I always had my nods with me. And that's key. Just like I think you need to have water on you at all times, you need to have your nods with you at all times. Because you know, go, you go out, jump out outside the vehicle to go investigate something. And that 15 minute investigation can turn into a 24 hour long firefight. So you don't have time to go back and get all the gear that you wish you had on you. You need to keep it on your body at all times. Ammo, water, spare battery for your radio, and you know, night vision goggles. So again, this is my GP pouch. I kept those items in there along with energy bars so I can snack when I'm out and about. So one GP pouch. Now let me talk about the IFAC. I wore mine on the back of my plate carrier. It was actually the team SOP for everybody to wear their IFAC on their back, either on their plate carrier or a lot of them wore them center line of their war belt. And the Army, that's counter how the Army treats an IFAC. You know, IFAC is individual first aid kit, meaning you should be using that kit on yourself if you get blasted. But the problem with relying on getting to your own IFAC, or if you become a casualty, somebody coming up and getting to your IFAC is, you could be, you know, your gear could be shot up, you're burnt, you burnt bloody from an explosion. The last thing you want is when I come up on a casualty, I have to dig around in your possibly burnt bloody gear trying to find your IFAC and maybe causing more harm to you. Not to mention, I don't know the status of your IFAC. I mean, the last time you packed that thing could have been five years ago and everything could be expired in it. It could be missing items. Don't know exactly what's in there, even though your unit might have SOPs. We found it's a lot easier and faster and safer if you wear the IFAC on your back and the IFAC you're wearing is for the other, is for the casualty you come upon. And let me explain how it goes. So if somebody you know goes out and gets blasted, the first person that gets to that casualty to treat that casualty, when he kneels down to assess that casualty, the second guy, which you should have a cover man come up and help you with that casualty, as you're kneeling down, that second guy is going to take either the IFAC off you. This ATS one actually unclips and you can pull the whole IFAC off or he's going to reach into your IFAC that's on your back, take out the contents of your IFAC and he's going to throw it down at your feet. So when you kneel down to treat your that casualty that you came upon, all the contents of your IFAC that you know what you packed are right there, you know, at your feet so you can immediately start using those items when you're working on that casualty. You're not trying to dig around in that burnt bloody gear trying to get to this other soldier's IFAC. That's just silly. And so you can work on that casually knowing you have the right items right there at your fingertips. And once you get done, you know, treating that casually and packaging, you know, packaging him up to move, you can always then dig through his gear, take out his IFAC materials and have your buddy reload your IFAC. Or later on, you know, get with a medic and have him reload you. But I think the SOP of wearing it on your back and when you kneel down, you have a second guy come and take out the contents and dump them at your feet so you're not digging around is a lot safer for that casualty because again, you're not digging around in his gear, possibly harming him. It's faster because again, you're not digging around and burnt bloody could be blown off in gear. So trying to rely on somebody else's IFAC to treat them, I think is just silly. I think the army has it wrong and I prefer the wearing it on your back technique. Now, staying on the theme of taking care of casualties, if you don't plan for casualties, you're letting yourself and your team down because you've been in enough gunfights, it's, it's going to happen inevitably. I've never lost a team member directly under my command or underneath my leadership. Had teammates uh, get wounded, lots of Afghans get wounded. So if you're not prepared to not only treat casualties, but transport casualties, you know, you're, you're planning for failure. One SOP that I learned way back in 2004 as we were getting ready, I think for my second Iraq tour, we went to a place called Direct Action Resource Center, Little Rock, Arkansas. It's a school that specializes in CQB. We're talking super high-end techniques for urban fighting. I've actually been through their, the same CQB course three different times just because you know it's so outstanding. But one of the things they showed us is a thing called the Darcy strap or dark strap. And that's a method of rigging tubular nylon into the back of your plate carrier to make transporting you, if you become a casualty, a thousand times better. 
And let me cover that right here. As you can see, I've got this tubular nylon webbing rigged into the back of this plate carrier. If you see in the photos, you know, it's present on my plate carrier and all my team members' plate carriers. The handle that comes on all your plate carriers and body armors, that's a feel good thing. That drag handle is pretty useless, pretty useless in reality. If you become a casualty and you're unconscious, nine times out of 10, if somebody just, you know, grabs that standard back drag handle, when they go to pull you, your body armor is gonna pull up off you, either coming up off you all the way, or it's gonna ride up into your neck, choking you, possibly causing more harm. You know, nothing like being choked out by your body armor as a dude drags you for 20 yards. This Darcy strap actually solves that and makes transporting you if you become a casualty, you know, 10 times easier at least. So the way this works is, is I have a giant tubular nylon loop rigged into the back of the plate carrier. There's a knot here at the end with this snap link. And up top here, you see I have this main knot here. It's actually a water knot. Uh, when you put on your plate carrier, you snap link this snap link into your belt, whatever belt you're wearing. And that's how you go on the mission. If you become a casualty and somebody needs to drag you, they actually reach for this knot. And when you pull this knot out, it's gonna give you a tubular nylon loop, uh, just big enough so when you're wearing your helmet, your head can kind of cradle into this loop. And when the guy goes to pull you, because it's linked into your belt at the waist, it actually helps lift your hips up off the ground, making you easy to drag. Also, it's not gonna pull your plate carrier off you or up into your neck because again, it's secured at your waist. And also, of course, you have a longer handle to drag a person with, so you're not you know, leaning down super far. You can have a little bit of situational awareness because you have about a foot of material here when you're dragging the person. So this is called the Darcy strap. This is something, again, I first saw in 2004. It's been a SOP on every team that I've been a part of since then. Uh, they actually make Spiritus, uh, the company Spiritus Systems, they actually make a commercial uh, Darcy strap now with permission from Darcy. It's their design. They make a commercial one. It's just a little bit more fancier. Instead of having a you know rubber band giant knot that you grab onto, it's actually this cool little pull flap. But again, it's secured the same way. I don't have a snap link on here, but there's a knot in the bottom. So if you don't want to rig your own, you can go ahead and purchase a Darcy strap. Like water, like extra batteries for your radio. Of course, carrying a full basic load. Uh, this Darcy strap is something that going into harm's way, I make all the guys put on their plate carriers. Because again, if you do not plan to treat and transport casualties, you're already set up for failure for the mission. You've got to have some sort of SOP so that in the gear to support it. One more thing with the cummerbund, I want to talk about side armor. In Special Forces, we do get issued side hard plates. I never wore side hard plates in Afghanistan. Because again, it's a balance of weight versus mobility. I'd rather be more mobile than armored up. Of course, I always wore, you know, front and back hard plates level four. But I did wear side soft armor. We don't get issued soft armor. I purchased my own side soft armor. I've had this, I think, all three tours in Afghanistan. These stop pistol rounds and frag. They don't stop rifle rounds. But just as you have a good chance of getting shot in combat, you have an equal chance of getting blown up. So having some soft armor or two protect against frag is better than nothing on the sides. So here it is, my fully rigged plate carrier for full blown combat, Afghanistan. Again, wore this for two tours. I've got it down pat. So if I was called back to active duty today to deploy to, deploy to some unknown country, I would take this exact very same setup. It follows my principles. Again, fighting stuff up front, support items in the back, so to me, this is the ultimate or ideal setup as it stands right now. Real quick, let me talk about ATS tactical gear. I know this seemed like a, you know, ATS tactical gear commercial, but let's face it, I trust ATS tactical gear. It's American made. It's owned by a special forces guy. So why would I not wear ATS tactical gear? But uh, if you've made it this long in the video, if you are interested in ATS Tactical Gear products, I have a discount code which will give you 10% off at checkout. If you type in STUKA10 at checkout, that will give you 10% off at ATSTacticalGear.com. 
All right, I hope you enjoyed this video. As always, I hope you found it you know, informative and entertaining. Hopefully this helped at least one person out with ideas on how to rig up their plate carrier. As always, I'm Jeff Gerwich and thanks for watching.